Hi everyone, welcome to my talk today, Decision Making in Nursing, and this is part of a Leadership in Nursing series on my YouTube channel, Support and Career Development for Nurses. And if you're interested, there's lots of free videos and the other videos on this series are Developing Your Leadership Skills, Coordinating Care, teamwork in nursing and delegating nursing care. All the videos are free, so do check them out on my YouTube channel. So today I'm going to look at the evolution of decision making with some of the models linked to references because I know some students will be watching this video and will probably be doing decision making modules and I'll also look at how to develop your decision making skills it's a very simple practical session giving you an overview and as I said it's aimed at students newly registered nurses and early career nurses developing your decision making skills and your leadership skills so I really hope it helps you today so for those of you that are doing assignments on decision making, I'm sure there's a few of you out there or are just interested in some of the theory relating to this concept. I'm going to start with the evolution of decision making as a concept as a, as a very brief overview and looking at the evolution of decision making in nursing. Um, it's decision making is derived from two fields from psychology and economics and you're going to read a lot about decision making tools and frameworks and concepts linked to decision making in nursing keeping it simple the literature talks of two main styles of decision making and approaches that you can use linked to rational decision making and more intuitive decision making processes and we've had this move more recently from rational to naturalistic decision making where decision making is seen viewed more as a continuum um, as, a, as opposed to a more deductive, rational, logical approach. However, um, nurses will use a mix of um, decision making styles depending on the situation. And I talked a little bit similarly with leadership styles. It will depend on the situation. Nurses make a range of decisions to suit different contexts. You make urgent time critical decisions when there's a crisis and a decision has to be made quickly versus decisions made over time following in-depth analysis. I remember being a nursing sister and we changed, I looked at changing the visiting times to make them more open on, um, on a neurology ward. And that could be taken, um, the, the decision was made over time with patients, collaborating with relatives and staff to come to a decision but it wasn't time critical or as time critical. Um, one thing I find very fascinating at the moment is with digital health, where we have algorithms prompting decisions. And it's something that students might want to discuss with their module leads, for example. Um, and are decisions linked to nursing care are derived from algorithmic care with electronic health records, for example, where we've got logical deductive um, decision making with the best options. And because um, I'm looking at that as well as part of my uh, PhD, looking at health um, electronic patient records and how nurses use of electronic um, patient records influences nurse patient interaction. So I have got a bit of an interest in this area. So looking at future decision making, we you'll be looking at electronic healthcare record scripts, prompts, checklists and standardised care plans that have become an integral part of nursing care. And when I started my career, all care plans were written from scratch and we used the nursing process to write care plans with patients and my um, nurse um, training it wasn't a degree then was very skills based training focusing on conditions signs and symptoms so I'd be able to write those care plans and have the knowledge to know what to put in the care plans so we have a very different approach now in nursing and having the digital algorithms across healthcare um, aims to assure the delivery of safe care and we have this changing contemporary nursing practice, which is happening at a, a very rapid rate. We've got digital algorithms across healthcare. If you go to your GP, there is, 
you know, the decision making is influenced by a digital pathway. The, the, the GP will be looking, as well as using professional judgment, but will be looking at a pathway of care um, which aids decision making. And, um, you know, the importance of electronic health records to promote clinical safety is not disputed at all. But what effect does it have on nursing decisions and professional judgment? And that's a question you might want to reflect on with your module leads or with your peers if you're already registered. An interesting paper from Leary et al. in 2021 is helpful with that discussion. Um, this is a thematic analysis of the prevention of future death reports in healthcare from coroner's reports in England and Wales from 2016 to 2019. And um, from analysing the thematic analysis, a theme came out, a deficit in skill or knowledge and it was linked to a failure or an ability or education to deviate from algorithmic care or policy when harmful or inappropriate. Um, so looking at um, task-based labour models, such as intentional rounding, using algorithmic care for making decisions, they, they're becoming more prevalent. But we do need to question that also safety critical work relies on professional judgment and expertise. And there's a real interesting debate to be had in nursing regarding the, these sort of topics. So looking at the initial models which have informed our current day decision models and decision making frameworks, it started with classical rational model from Brunswick, Egon Brunswick in 1952, where individuals use cues from the environment and aim to be, your decision making aims to be accurate, empirically accurate. So the decision maker is objective, they evaluate information and consider alternatives, consequences before selecting a solution and making a decision and may attach values to different choices to come to that decision. So it's a rational, logical and impersonal approach. Um, it's based on organisations, best interests, and it aims to maximise value. Um, so you've got these known consequences of what each division, what will happen with each decision. However, because we work in uncertain working environments in nursing and humans are subjective, um, the criticism of this model might be that you might not have all that information to hand when you're on a busy day to day um, shift in nursing. And in healthcare, clinical environments don't always allow you the time to check a Cochrane database to speak to everybody involved. We still have to make certain decisions in rapidly changing situations. The next model is the administrative model, and that focuses on how decisions are made in the real world. And this came from Herbert Simons, who wanted to replace the classical decision making model with more of an economic approach. Um, this model is focuses on the decisions that are made in the real world and um, there is this concept bounded rationality. Um, you're bounded by what's going on in your real world environment essentially and you do not always have complete information. You don't always have time to analyse all the calculations, the outcomes and the alternatives. So you're looking for the best solution with the data that you've got available. So it's more of a pragmatic approach, I would say. And it's reliant on individuals' experiences and what data they have to hand. Um, and it's more of a broader descriptive model, really explaining how managers make decisions, but it doesn't explain how they're going to do this. So it's more of a descriptive model. The political model, um, there was a move to this model and Pfeiffer in 1981 discusses this model in the book Power in Organisations. It's driven by the agendas of people rather than rational processes and decision is made through discussion, negotiation and political bargaining. It's used when there is a high risk of failure um, and a risk uh, because of uncertainty 
in the situation and manager, managers may form a coalition and work together collaboratively to resolve um, and to make decisions, to resolve an issue and make these decisions. It relies on an exchange of different viewpoints and, and everybody will become more different assumptions, biases and views. Um, it may be less re reliable because of that, because it depends on the people participating and their experience. And strong personalities may win, win arguments with decisions. And I've witnessed this many times over the years where a quieter personality may be dismissed in a group and they might have had very insightful points to make and they should have been listened to at the time before that decision was made. But because of a more dominant character in a group, um, a different decision and pathway was taken. Um, a good chair in a meeting will facilitate um, collaborative decision making and shared decision making if there is a dominant character. Um, you might have a strict plan or an agenda which also can help and have some reading before you meet as a group potentially. Um, and in clinical practice, having team building and looking at team dynamics may also sort of help with this situation and this type of um, decision making. Moving on from the classical models, we have a, a move to cognitive processes and Hammond in 1978 recognised that nursing judgments are commonly made under uncertain situations. And he describes how nurses combine information and they continually revise judgments using cognitive processes when they have new information. And he calls this revision judgments. And in 1996, Hammond proposed this cognitive continuum theory where decision making process, it, it's a whole process rather than just having an end result and it includes both intuitive and analytical pro processes. And then you have Ham in 1988. All the references are in the reference list at the end of this if you're doing assignments as well. Um, Ham found that experienced decision makers appeared to make decisions without following policies and procedures. Um, there was this informal decision making taking place using intuition and um, Ham explored the influence of experience on this decision making. And we have the concept of intuition where experienced decision makers make a decision without following a procedure. And a lot of people used to talk about this um, when I started my nursing uh, and we looked at intuit intuition and Benner's work from novice to expert. And, and it was described as a gut feeling, you know something's wrong. And it was really interesting because looking at more an analysis of intuition, um, what researchers were saying were actually it's not just something that's plucked out of the air. It's because you've experienced something so many times that you're cognitively bringing all the information together and systematically analysing it very rapidly that you can't even articulate why you've got that feeling potentially. You know, it's similar to a mum bringing a child to A&E where the child, they just say the child is not right, there's something wrong. And that's because they have so much experience of looking after that baby that they know something's wrong. Um, they might not be able to articulate it, but what they're doing is processing lots of things at the same time without realising that the skin colour might be different or the breathing looks different. So it's really interesting looking at intuition as a concept as well. And um, so in 1998, Ham created this concept of cognitive continuum, um, which is interesting to look at. When looking at nursing decision making, it's also helpful to look at the two models of decision making um, from Banning 2008. And um, Banning explores the two, these two models, the information processing model that's linked to cue recognition or acquisition, and um, the information that you're receiving, interpreting, and that you're evaluating. And an example would be decision trees, and some of you may have covered that in modules already, where you're looking at decision trees and alternatives and options to assess um, decision outcomes. 
And then you've also got the um, intuitive humanist model from novice to expert that's differentiated by this intuitive judgment. The experienced nurse views the whole picture and uses patterns rather than viewing parts in a situation. So you've got this um, link again Pat, that I talked about previously with those classic models of r rational versus intuitive models and theories. So knowing that quite a few of you have got uh, essays and assignments on nursing decision making, I have gone through a few papers in this area and I've, I've chosen some that I think might be helpful to integrate into assignments and focused on literature examining nurses decision making and the impact of facilitators and what hinders decision making. There's, it's, there's limited papers in this area, but we really do need more research, especially in the light of decision making and digital health and algorithms being influencing nursing decision making as well. So starting with Nibelink and Brewer, um, this paper entitled Decision Making in Nursing Practice is an integrative review. And it aimed to identify and summarise factors and processes related to registered nurses, patient care, decision making in medical and surgical environments. And it concluded that acute care nurses employ a variety of decision making factors and processes and informally identified experienced nurses to be important resources. And in my opinion, I would totally concur with these findings that um, I would use a variety of decision making depending on the context of the decision being made, if it's an urgent or a more long term analytical decision, but also that um, it's so important to have experienced nurses there for people early career nurses to go and talk to and gain support from. And, and this is what this paper is essentially saying. Also, a finding from the paper was that increased experience and colleague collaboration increases confidence and decision making ability. I think many newly registered nurses that I talk to, the one thing they worry about when they register is, is that decision making. And it's to try and get the message across that you've always got somebody you can defer to and ring if that if the registered nurse that's coordinating a shift is not on that ward, they've gone to theatre, there is an escalation process, there is always somebody else you can ring or talk to on the end of a phone. Usually there's somebody in practice you can go and talk to. Never ever hold back on asking for, for support with your decision making when you start in your career. Um, another really interesting finding is that nurses decision making is influenced by organisational culture. And I think that is so important that the culture is about supporting nurses and being open so that because in my view, nurses won't escalate and won't ask. And that's dangerous if, if nurses don't feel that they can go to colleagues and, and ask for support with their decisions. And also situation awareness. And situation awareness is developed through understanding the present state of a situation. So it's having access to as much information as you can about that situation to understand, to gain insights. And so, for example, electronic patient records, many nurses will say it's fantastic that you've got all the information in one digital repository, for example, and you've got access to that. Um, but how quick can you get to that information? I mean, sometimes some of the systems are set up, they're very medical orientated and nurses are the largest user group of electronic patient records. I mean, something very interesting to look at. Obviously, I'm looking at it for, as part of my PhD. I'm looking at um, electronic patient record use linked to nurse patient interactions, but you, looking at decisions and professional judgment linked to electronic patient re nurses professional judgment is a fascinating, a fascinating topic to look at. Um, Hag Baheri, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, it. This is another interesting paper in 2004 and um, it's entitled the factors facilitating and inhibiting 
effective decision making in nursing and it's a qualitative study and it's similar the findings were similar to Nibelink and Brewer um, they uh, the researchers analyzed 38 nurses lived experiences regarding factors affecting clinical function and decision making and they concluded that being competent and self-competent are the most important factors influencing nurses decision making and again I would totally concur and agree with this um, being competent is about having like taking your time with decision making developing your skills um, you need to have experiential learning where you're reflecting on practice and gaining feedback from your peers. Being competent is also about developing your knowledge base. Um, if you're in a specific specialist area, doing specialist courses um, will help your decision making because you're gaining more in-depth knowledge again, but it takes time and that essentially will develop your self-confidence. Also, organisational structure again, similar to Nibelink and Brewer, and access to supportive resource, resources and nurse education, and that is paramount with decision making. Chung et al. 2021, I chose this paper because it focuses on shared decision making, clinical decision making, which is um, coming to the fore over the last decade really um, and Chung et al used a qualitative, qualitative research design semi-structured interviews were conducted with 21 nurses at a medical center in northern Taiwan and they the results linked they did um, content analysis of the interview narrative and identified three themes re relating to knowledge regarding shared decision making um, trigger discussion and coordination and respect of socio-cultural factors and I think it's just an interesting paper to look at because um, you know there isn't that many papers looking at the impact of different types of decision making on, on care and on nurses decision making. Looking at how you develop your decision making skills as a student newly registered nurse or early career nurse. Ways to develop your decision making, in my opinion, um, after making many poor decisions in my life as well, um, it's not all about perfect decision making. I have made, um, gone at home after shifts thinking, oh, I shouldn't have made that decision. And as an early career nurse, you know, that does happen. But it's about talking about it and putting it in the context of everything else that's going on and in a supportive environment is the key to developing your decision making. Um, observing practice, so observing people making decisions, and you can do that as first, second, third year students. You'll see expert nurses and expert leaders making decisions and saying to them, oh, you made that decision, it's very decisive, you know, and, and discussing with them how they make their decisions, but also reflecting on your own decisions. And it will take a lot longer to make decisions when you first start out. I'm now much more decisive. I don't beat myself up when I've made a, a slightly difficult decision and I, it perhaps might not have been the right decision. Um, you know you, you go through those experiences and you realize actually in the scheme of things this is quite a small decision I've made you know perhaps it wasn't the right one but I'll learn from it and it's really about learning and developing your skills and not being hard on yourself I think um, and not expecting to know it all you won't get on those post registration courses develop your knowledge talk to staff observe shadow reflect and you will get there Increase your self-awareness um, and it's all about experiential learning. Um, accessing resources and peer support. So what is there out there to develop my skills and, and my decision making? Is there any group support um, with your employer? Is there any um, national forums or local forums that you can join? Access clinical supervision. If they don't off offer it with your employer, you can seek it externally. Um, or a career coach or a career advisor. Um, and then the final thing I would say is academic and professional courses. Um, and you've got modules on clinical decision making and you've got modules right up to 
um, nurses that are advanced nurse practitioners who are making clinical diagnoses um, by obtaining physical histories from patients and making um, you know those decisions and 80% of a clinical diagnosis comes from history taking so there's a lot of history taking modules linked to that and it's all about getting a whole picture of of a person when you're making that clinical decision making um, and clinical diagnosis. So there's some, there's some really interesting courses out there, but developing your skills in whichever field you're in and your knowledge and your competence will come with academic courses being aligned to your professional experiences. I have some, as I mentioned earlier, some videos that may help looking at teamwork, looking at developing your leadership skills, delegating, um, coordinating care, and the differences between different roles and role boundaries. If you're making a decision and you're going to delegate to people in your team, you need to know what a nursing associate does, what a nursing assistant does, or a healthcare support worker or assistant practitioner does in your area of work. Those support worker roles you'll be delegating to. If you're making a decision, you may be making a group decision or involving the team. So that's very important. Um, so it's just a lot more depth in those videos about those topic areas. Professional education and academic courses. So you've got post registration specialist courses to develop knowledge, skills and competence. You've got a master's in healthcare leadership. Um, you've got advanced nurse practitioner courses, if that's the route you want to take, clinical decision making modules and the NHS Leadership Academy. And I have um, two talks, well, three talks on education. The first being which post registration course, if you want some advice on courses when you register, how to look at funding if you have no local funding offered and you have to look externally. And um, I've also got a talk on tips on um, applying for funding as well if you're interviewed for funding externally. And finally, the references. I know I get asked by so many students for these references um, for assignments. So I have added some and these sessions are very much an overview, a simple, practical overview. But I often get asked for references. So uh, you might want to stop the videos as I go through some of these references. And hopefully there'll be something that you might be able to include in assignment or it's triggered something for you to reflect on with your module leads. And if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments in YouTube or you may prefer, rather than putting it on a public forum, to DM me on my Twitter or my website or my Instagram. If you're interested in buying any of my books, I've also got links to my books in the YouTube description. Um, and I hope that the session helps you in some way.